You're listening to The Main Loop, a bi-monthly podcast all about what makes games interesting, engaging, and most importantly, fun to play. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 15 of The Main Loop. I am Sean, and I'm joined once again, as always and forever, by Stu. Howdy. We're IRL again, which is good. This is weird. I know. <laughs> I'm like looking at your face. It's gross. Not in like Skype in delay. In life. I'm just happy we did it after you grew your beard back. That's true. That was I'm a rough week. I'm not sure I would have been able to have been in the same room. <laughs> that was a rough week. Would have... Uh... Slowly walked away. Yeah. Well, it's a nice summer day. It's uh, almost America Day here in yeah. the States. America. Yeah, it's the third of America. So July, the month of July is just America. It should just be called America. <laughs> Lots of America. Go June, America, August, September, October. Pre and post America. Cold Christmas. <laughs> yeah. So uh, some follow-up from... Two weeks ago, two episodes ago, <laughs> Stu finally wrote about <laughs> randomness in Hearthstone and magic. Yeah, not 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 two weeks ago, <sighs> nearly two months ago. <laughs> Fun times. Yeah, I fi- finally got around to publishing my thoughts. Um, pretty much summed it up with the stuff we talked about uh, in episode thirteen. So I don't want to rehash it here, but um, y'all should check that out. You can find it at amateurmythology.wordpress.com. Yeah, <laughs> I nice. don't feel embarrassed saying that. URL at all. Hey, domain names are expensive. True. That, that is fair. Yeah. Cool. Um, so what are you playing? Let's go let's 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 get in here. Let's get in the meat and potatoes this week. Yeah, yeah, let's jump right in. So I have attempted to play ukulele. Okay. I turned it down like to the lowest graphic setting. Um, <laughs> and my computer barely runs it. Okay. Um and it's awful. <laughs> <laughs> is it awful because of your computer not being able to run it, or is it awful because you don't think the game's good? Uh, so there's this moment in the tutorial, and uh, yeah, there's this moment in the tutorial where you're, where it's like starting to teach you how to do things in the game, right? Like jump and, and dive and duck and dip and dodge and all that stuff. And you jump onto this moving platform, and it's trying to teach you how to how to basically crouch under something. Um, You jump onto the platform, and then a text bubble pops up and goes, this is the obligatory part where we teach you how to crouch under something. (laughs) It's like, you should probably get close to that barrier and then crouch under it to get underneath it. And it's like that for the entire game. Okay. At least for the first hour and a half that I played through. That's just, like, so self-referential and, like, copies all of these really bad design decisions from like 20 years ago yeah like one to one so the like tutorials are just like text scrolling across the screen right it like references the fact that it's a game every other text bubble where it's like at this part of the game we should probably do this obligatory thing and it's like "Ah, i'm not so the joke wears out the joke's not funny no yeah it's not and it's just like it, it because making it re- like referencing the fact that you're doing the annoying tutorial thing doesn't make it any less annoying. Yeah, I think someone just made a design decision to be like, we're just gonna. It's basically a remaster in a lot of ways. It's not really a new game. Yeah. And someone just made a design decision that this is gonna be a remaster, and we're gonna copy all of the old elements and uh, go from there. And it's, it just falls completely flat. I mean, obviously, I never played Banjo-Kazooie. I, like, kind of heard about it and always wanted to. Yeah. So, like, maybe I'm not the target audience, but I would find it really hard to get into it just because I was expecting something that was kind of, like, a new interpretation. I was, like, willing to kind of struggle through it a little bit, but... It's not what they gave you. Yeah, it's... It's, like, not even worth trying to fight through. And, and maybe I would be a little more happy if I could, like, see the beautiful graphics. Because right. Yuka and Lele are both, like, gorgeous character models. And they're really cute and fun. But, like, there was this one puzzle I was I was trying to go through. You're, like, trying to collect these pages. Yeah. That, 
an evil character is trying to use to take over the world. And there's this one puzzle where a page has been ripped up and torn and like the, the little parts of the page are somewhere in this part of the world. Um, and all you're doing is, is going and looking for the, the pieces. Yeah. And I was like, this is something where like in Mario 3D world or something that would have been, that I would like really enjoy like that yeah. type of puzzle. Um, and I didn't here and I thought that was really telling just because I, I didn't feel like I was kind of learning through the puzzle or like yeah. experiencing cool things it was just kind of like there's some pieces of paper lying around gotta find them that's always weird when like you come to a moment in a game and, and you're fe- the feeling of I've done this exact thing in other games and had fun and I'm doing it in this game and not having fun and can't even put my finger on why but it's just not like it's not working. And it's, I feel like a lot of things work super well on paper and like the concept is really sound and then the, it doesn't feel like the, like the polish and effort goes into actually like implementing it. Like, oh, it's a, it's a, you know, it's got this quick jumping phase. People love, or it's got a, a big wall jump section. People love wall jumping. It's always been fun. But if you don't like actually take the time to like tweak it and play through it and make sure it feels fun like you're just doing it for the sake of doing it and that doesn't that doesn't equal profits. Yeah, and, and I think it also says to me that like Nintendo has kind of perfected the three D platformer. Like <laughs> Yeah. Like I guess Mario three D World isn't technically that, but it, it uses a lot of those elements and right. like if you're gonna do the cute three D platformer thing, yeah. You either have to do something very, very different or just like knock it out of the park yeah because you're always going to get compared to whatever the latest mario is Hmm. and that's a really tough comparison to make because you're like no indie studio is ever going to have time to polish those mechanics the same way nintendo does um and and i think that's just a a challenge moving forward that companies kind of have to reckon with that if you want to do something indie and different and be like a very particular art style or have a cool narrative I think those all work, but just trying to do the, we're going to be a cute platform right. is tough. Well, and it's a bummer because, like, Rare did, like, Nintendo really, like, okay, Super Mario 64 comes out, blows everybody's mind, and then that's like, well, this is the new, this is how you make games. Like, this is what a 3D game should be. And then Rare came along and really perfected that throughout the life of the 64 with Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie. Donkey Kong 64, you know, arguably it had, it had its issues, but it was very ambitious. Um, Conquer's Bad Fur Day. Like, these really, they're still, like, the benchmark of great 3D platforming games. And, I don't know, I'm bummed that ukulele is just not, it doesn't seem like it's living up to its its heritage. And it, and it seems like it tried too hard to, to like, we're gonna, we're gonna really, like, recapture the glory days of Banjo-Kazooie. And if people want that, they'll They'll get out there in 64 yeah. and they'll play Banjo Kazooie. It's just it's just really weird because when I think of a remaster, yeah. you kind of just get to make those excuses, right? Like, oh, we don't yeah. want to change the game. You're really just coming to play it for all of the fun times you had, but it's really pretty now, which is right. as pretty as you probably think you remember it was. Yeah. And that's fun because like every time you go through a level, you can at least like get the remembrance of, oh, I went through this level, it was fun. Right. Maybe I'm not having as much fun now, but it's still cool. Ukulele doesn't have any of that. I mean, mm. it's still the same idea, but they're totally new characters. So you have to start fresh from what you've got. Yeah. And I feel like they just, they didn't. It's just like, there, there's even weird, like, design twerk, twerks. Twerks. Twerk it. <laughs> uh, where, like, in order to exit the game, you have to go into the options screen in in the menu. Huh. Or just, like, weird things that are, like, part and parcel for what I would have expected a game to be 20 years ago. Yeah. That I just I just don't get anymore. Or like all of the sound for the characters is like wah 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 for every beat. Yeah. And it's just like dude this gets really old. <laughs> or 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 another one so you're like collecting feathers to to get super to get power ups. Yeah. Right? So you collect a bunch of feathers or quills or whatever and then you can trade them in for a power up. Like, you can do a smash or, like, more energy or whatever. Yeah. And the character that gives them to you is a snake. Mm-hmm. So he he speaks and hisses. 
Sure, as one does. Yeah. He is, speaks parcel tongue, as yeah, you'd it's, expect. It's, <laughs> it's fine. Uh, but then when you like go to select the powers, mm -hmm. they're also written in Snake. So there's like five S's and then like Uber Jump. And it's like, why? This is not like, this is just a basic usability thing. Like you just need to write out the thing that it is. I shouldn't have to think about what a Super Jump is. Right. And it's just little things like that where I feel like I get why they made the decision they did but that doesn't mean it was the right one. Yeah. Well, and it's like you're trying too hard to... It just has to go through that refining process. I mean, I think about, and we'll, we'll get to this later, but having an idea for a game that involves the word humble in the title, and it'd be really easy to like, everything in, game, in the game is a humble something. You yeah. get a humble sword, and you go to the humble store, and you open the <laughs> humble door, and then there's a humble roof. And like the joke would just get old really fast if you just keep like everything doesn't have to be there's a difference between like having a cohesive like feel and design elements versus just like you're shoving your game like up its own butt and down its own throat at the same time and it's just like you can just like yeah you can let it breathe a little bit yeah and i think like thinking about games is kind of a form of technology i mean like it you have to respect innovations that have been made in the last 20 years. Yeah. You can't release a new game under the same assumptions that you made 20 years ago. It'd be like trying to re-release Citizen Kane today, but call it like Citizen Jane and then <laughs> not use special effects and like do the exact same sure. thing. It's like, okay, but what do you do? Like there have been so many innovations to the way we think about storytelling, the right. way we think about game design, the way we think about usability. Yeah. That you're just ignoring. Yeah. And that that's what the, I really struggle with that. It's like I get that you want to make this retro, but retro is a feel. It's not like a like I want to put this person back in the 1980s so right. they can experience what it was like, damn it. It's like yeah. that's not that's not fun. Well, we just had that game a game just came out called Strafe. Mm -hmm. Which is this, you know, they, they hail it as like the 1996 shooter and all the, it's a, it's a great example of like shoving the joke, the joke down its own throat too much of like, they talk about everything like it's the latest and most advanced graphics and pixelation and gore effects and all the marketing tries to be very 90s, but it fails. Like it fails pretty miserably because it just tries too hard and they just keep, they, they want to make sure you understand the joke. Uh, and then all the reviews of the game have been pretty negative for for a lot of that same reason of like it's trying way too hard to like be Doom or Quake again that they they didn't refine it's like everything that yeah we tried to do everything that was good about those games but also we kept everything that sucked about those games or even made that a focus like the bad jumping mechanics or the floaty jumping or the difficulty aiming or like the insane difficulty of it it's like well that's not necessarily a good, just because it was in those original games doesn't mean it was like a good decision or a good feature. Yeah, I mean, I think what's so disappointing is like, even though Nintendo has kind of perfected the 3D platformer, it doesn't have to be the only 3D platformer in the world. Like, right. I feel like that was a lot of the excitement about ukulele. It wasn't like going back to Banjo-Kazooie, it was like, 3D platformers are really fun, and yeah. this is the only company that's doing it right now. Yeah. Why can't we just, like, make another... Like, why can't you yeah. just make a, a new, good 3D platformer? Yeah, especially because a lot of, like, indie developers and, and even bigger developers have, have been really making great, like, leaps and bounds in modern 2D platforming games. Yeah. Things like Little Big Planet and hyper light drifter or yeah that's not 2d that's not platform yeah but it's, it's but the still it's the side scroller right? yeah um and even a game that captures like that captures that retro feel so well is like super meat boy where the developers set out you know i remember them talking about in their in indie game the movie they're talking about like we wanted to make the game that like our 12 year old selves would have been talking about like at lunch or during recess um and Super Meat Boy has that feel. Like, it, it feels like a retro game, but it also feels very modern. It's very fast. Uh, the mechanics, it, it feels great on, like, a PS4 controller, and it, and it looks good. Like, it's still very modern. It takes advantage of memory to, like, do the really cool display thing at the end where you, yeah. see, you die over and exactly. over. Exactly. That's really awesome. Yeah, and so they, they did cap capture that, oh, this feels like the kind of game I would have loved as a kid, Versus this feels like a game I played as a kid. Yeah, the you know? literal game. <laughs> yeah. Because if I wanted that, like, I would just, 
download an emulator or go to my local used game store and get Super Mario Brothers again or get Banjo Kazooie, and I would actually play that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so just to kind of wrap that up, uh, uh, Super Lucky's Tale is coming out for Xbox next year. Yeah. Very similar concept about like trying to remake a platformer. Yeah. Interesting, though, they're trying to put it in 4K. And kind of, I, I don't really care about that, but it suggests to me that they might be trying to do a new take on it instead yeah. of just like, here's another old thing. Right. And I'm kind of curious to see what they do um, hmm. and like contrast it with sort of what happened with ukulele. Yeah. Cool. Well, I, uh, I have not been playing very many games lately. I've been watching a lot. <laughs> uh, I just have not had time to really sit down and have, haven't had time to have like any meaningful play sessions. So I've just had a lot of um, things on in the background, been watching a lot of Twitch, but what's great is all this week is Summer Games Done Quick. So if you're not familiar, Games Done Quick is an organization that puts on these speed running marathons twice a year that um, benefit Doctors Without Borders, which is an awesome organization. And so it is, I mean, 24 seven for the entire week of speed runs. And it's pretty awesome. It's a lot of fun. Uh, if you haven't ever really gotten into speed runs, I think SGDQ and um, awesome, awesome Games Done Quick is what is the event in the winter. They're really fun events to get into because um, they're really, there's a lot of interaction because it's always a speed runner and then a couch of a few people who speed run the same game. And so they help explain like, okay, this is the glitch that we're gonna do, or this this part is difficult because this is how the game determines where these enemies spawn or things like that. Um, help you actually understand understand how the game works. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, um, so that can be really fun, especially as I'm now studying and learning about game development and how to program games. It's really fun to have them explaining some of these things because it actually makes sense to me as a programmer. Like, oh, they're talking about how if you if you can jump over this wall, then the game won't spawn enemies in this next area and you can go through really fast. And I actually understand like, oh, I get like why that would happen because there's like an event that's supposed to be triggered when you go through the door and that says you're in the level and just understanding more of that has been really fun. And so I really enjoy watching speed runs for that. Uh, and then I've also just spent a lot of time watching a guy speed running Super Mario Brothers because it's just really, really yeah, fun cool. to watch um, this game that I remember just killing me as a kid. So that's mostly what I've been doing. So I don't have a lot to, uh, to talk about so i'm shaking my head disappointedly are you? Yeah, I, I i get that um i did start and this would be a good transition into the switch cast Yeah, let's do it. I The uh, first DLC pack for Breath of the Wild was released on Friday. So today is Monday, July 3rd. So this came out three days ago. And so this is for, you pay for both of them up front, right? Correct. And then you, yes. this one comes out now and then you get the second one in the winter. Right? Correct. Correct. So this one is the Master Trial. Uh, and so this includes the uh, hard mode, which people were excited about. And as well as some new uh, gear, new armor sets to find, and then the Master Trial, which is this, uh, most Zelda games have had this, where you like go into an area that ha you get no equipment, and if you can get through all 40 dungeons or whatever it is, then you get some big power up. In this case, you get the Master Sword is always fully charged instead of having to wait, so you will just be OP for the rest of the game. So I'm definitely working on doing that. Um, but the hard mode sounds legit <laughs> as in like the hardest enemies in the game these lionels will spawn in these in the opening zone forcing you to like sneak around naked and afraid to avoid drawing their attention because there's there's nothing you can do there are only four in the uh the broader like hyrule before the castle right there's like four spots where the lionels I there's, think so. There's like the mountain pass. There's another one in the snow. Yeah. There's like the electric Lionel. And yeah. I think there's one more. Yes. And those are like the, and you know where they're at and you can and avoid And you stay them. away from them because they will wreck you. Yeah. There was this actually one time just in the regular mode, I was like kind of flying across some snow capped hills. Yeah. 
And then I just like take a billion damage and start falling. I was like, why did that happen? And I, as I'm falling, I look down and I just see a snowy Lionel there. I'm like, oh. He shot me out I'm of the gonna, sky. I'm yeah. gonna probably die now. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's a bad place. And so those guys can spawn in the opening zone of the hard mode. So there, I mean, this is legit. I think people were probably going, oh, Nintendo doing yeah, a hard Nintendo. mode. Ha ha, LOL. This will be no problem. And then it's like, oh crap. There's a Lionel, and he got angry, and he lit the whole field on fire, and I have nowhere to hide. And then he shot me out of a tree, and I'm dead. So I'm not doing hard mode. I'm not a hard mode guy. I'm a normal mode for life yeah. type player. And we, we talked about that actually a couple episodes ago. Uh, I'll find the episode to for past reference, but where we talked about hard modes versus normal modes in gaming and not liking when you feels like you're missing out on the real experience by not playing the hard mode, this does not sound like that. This no. sounds like if you really want to punish yourself, do hard mode. So if you want to play Dark Souls in Hyrule, <laughs> yes, exactly. Nailed it. Yeah, the Legend of Zelda Souls. So that's out. And other than that, I did get a nice Switch portability test this week uh, at Denver Comic Con. I took my Switch with me, um, played it with a buddy in line for some panels performed admirably it's Sweet. very easy to quickly like get it out of my little case and pop the little joy con thingies with the buttons that you need otherwise they suck <laughs> yeah yeah the punchy con extenders pop those on play some mario kart in line and then really quickly pack it up when it's time to move i mean it was awesome like i couldn't believe how like admirably it performed as a totally portable hey we have 30 minutes to sit and play mario kart let's do it oh, that's nice so that's actually really exciting yeah and then something I learned about the Switch that maybe uh, you knew, and I'm going to be an idiot. I'm sure everyone know, knew this. I did not realize that in the Switch dock, of course, there's the power input, which is a USB-C plug-in. Yep. There's the HDMI out. Yep. Then there's a USB Type-A plug, and that's for your Pro Controller cord to charge oh. instead of plugging it into the wall charger. So I've had my Pro Controller like over on like a coffee table plugged in like like it's an iPhone charging station. And then I was listening to, uh, I think the I accidental, yeah, I was listening to the accidental tech podcast, and one of them mentioned like, hey, the Switch Dock is great because it's got this other port, and I have my plural controller, and I was like, that's what that's for. Sure enough, plug that in. Now my little, now it's all in one area, and it's yeah. Do I have to complete hard mode to, to get this? Yes, you have to complete <laughs> the Breath of the Wild DLC, and then the port opens up. Okay. Yeah. Otherwise, it just takes you to the store every time you plug in your Pro Controller. No, it's great. So, like, my awesome. Pro Controller charges off the Switch dock, and it was just one of those, like, thanks, Nintendo. I had no clue. Yeah. Now, I have a whatever the opposite of thanks. That, well, that was, okay, that was a genuine thanks, Nintendo. Here's my uh, thanks, thanks Nintendo, Nintendo with sarcasm. Uh, I had to, so the one cable that was not run through my wall in my TV room, I know this is the biggest white wine of all time, but I mounted my, my TV on the wall last year and I did the whole thing where I routed all the cables through the wall so you don't, you don't see any cords like a dangling down. You just don't see them. So I finally did that whole deal, but then I got the switch and I had not run the HDMI cable for the switch through the wall thing yep. yet. I just hadn't done it. So this weekend, I finally did that. Ran everything through. I had a bad audio cable I had to replace anyway, but I get the HDMI cable for the Switch run through, and I realize it is about nine inches, maybe eight inches shorter than the other HDMI. The HDMI cable for the Apple TV and the HDMI cable for uh, my cable box all seem to be a standard length. <laughs> the switch, the included switch HDMI cable is about between six and nine inches shorter than those. You know what they're probably doing? They're probably just buying standard HDMI cables and then cutting them off and inserting them. Of course, them. they have to. Why wouldn't they? <laughs> and so I get everything hooked back up and realize with it run through the wall now, I cannot plug it into my switch dock unless I put it in a super awkward location. So luckily I had another HDMI cable laying around that was a standard length. But I was just like, really, Nintendo? That's like, you, you, everything has to be so proprietary that you can't even include like the normal, like whatever, six foot cable. It was like, nope, this one's five foot seven. <laughs> <laughs> so that sucked. Five foot seven cleats. <laughs> yeah, that led to me cursing, uh, cursing the name of Nintendo briefly. But now that it's all hooked up, it's great. 
It's probably it's probably just supply chain problems, Josh. Oh my gosh, maybe that's why they can't keep switches out because they can't they can't get enough of these these yeah, these, these, these two short HDMI cables that they want. <laughs> They have to get them custom made. We could have like a million of these if you just want with a standard length. Yeah. No, no, we need it slightly shorter. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So, yeah, that's about that. There's not a lot on my radar for the Switch right now as far as games I want. Uh, I mean, Splatoon 2 is right. coming out in three weeks. Yeah. That's about it. The other thing I've, the only thing I've realized, though, is how much I love the Switch game cases. Like I want every game physical copy because I just think the cases are super cool and nice, I like yeah. the little tiny cute cartridges, and so I'm just like, what games are available physically? <laughs> like maybe I'm I'm just gonna buy all of the physically available games, even even one two switch. I'm I'm not no, it's, I'm no, kidding. I'm not I'm never going to buy one why, two switch. Why would you do that? Like I'm never going to buy one two switch ever. You, you could probably burn money for more fun if you for being honest well, i mean i feel like it would be just as fun to just pretend that i own one two switch like i could just hand a punch con to my wife yeah and then go like okay now shake it near your face and pretend you're cleaning you're wiping pie off of your face now go and we'll do that for eight seconds and that's the exact same as if we were playing the real one yeah, two switch I think game that's so funny is like if they had included it on the Switch just standard. Yeah. I would have thought it was the greatest thing ever. Yeah. Like, this Another is good awesome. pack in. Yeah. Like Wii Sports, where like the still the best game on the Wii, Wii Tennis, just came with the Wii. Like yeah, worth the great. cost of admission. Right. No, nope. has to cost fifty bucks. Like why? And you yeah. know what? If if Breath of the Wild had not been amazing, the only story would have been just how garbage. <laughs> right. One two switches. Yeah. Can you imagine if like Breath of the Wild hadn't come out at launch? As if it was like, and then a week later you'll get this. Everybody would have returned to the Switch. Yeah. I'm like that's nice. Nintendo would have become Sega if they had done that. Like, oh, we're at we're exiting the hardware business because we just lost all of the Switch money. That that sweet sweet Switch money. Yeah. Well. Anyway. Let's, uh, yeah, so we already talked about Summer Games Done Quick going on, but uh, a couple other things happening, because it is the summer. Uh, the Steam Summer Sale is going on, so you're welcome. You can immediately stop listening to this, yeah, just empty kidding. your bank account, and go buy everything on Steam. Um, I don't know, have, have you found anything on Steam Summer Sale that you've really got to have them all this year? There hasn't been a ton. There are like a few games that are on early access and stuff, but yeah. those aren't, like, discounted enough for me yeah. like, yeah, let's go spend 30 bucks instead of 50. And see it and hope it's good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there, there have been a couple, but I'm also not... There haven't been any that are, that are like, jumping out. Like, I yeah. might get, like, Hyper Light Drifter yeah. or, like, uh, Hollow Knight or something that are, that are on the cheaper end. I could also do... I, I'm, I'm probably going to pick up Firewatch before the, the sale ends just because that's one of the ones I wanted. Yeah, Firewatch is pretty great. But there's nothing that was like, oh, this is like the must-have. Um, yeah. So I don't know. It's been a, it's been a pretty quiet year for, for indies in general. I yeah. Think. It'll be kind of interesting to see how that all shakes out. I don't know. Yeah. There hasn't been anything that's like super jumped out. I'm I'm still probably gonna pick up Doom from last year's Doom because I've just I've played the demo level. It's really really fun, and it's like fifteen bucks on the Steam sale. Um, Dishonored two is also down to like twenty bucks. Oh yeah, that's right. And I loved the first Dishonored. I've read so many mixed things about Dishonored two, which makes me glad that it's deeply discounted because it might be a good time to actually pick it up. Yeah. Other than that, last year last year Steam seal I remember being Steam seal the Steam seal last year the seal broke. And I was much more spend happy. Yeah, so. just ready to go all in. I think I got Stardew Valley for like a dollar or something like that. Which, when that comes on the Switch, that's going to be game over. Because that game is so... Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if there's like... So, like Crossing support groups for and, it. <laughs> and Stardew Valley and Harvest Moon. Just like what happened. Like, yeah. Will there, will there be a player base that just like buys the Switch for those three games and then never? Battle comes? of the Farm Life Simulator games never yeah. comes out of their base. <laughs> Man, I yeah. I mean, if I could get Harvest Moon sixty four for a reasonable price on eBay, you you wouldn't see me again for months. I'd yeah. be I'd be doing multiple playthroughs, marrying everybody, getting all the animals. So because I think there was one rumored for the Switch. I can't remember. I think you're right. Or maybe it's the three DS. I hope it's the Switch. Yeah, I don't want to buy a 3DS. Yep. The 3D on the 3DS just 
the three. Why? <laughs> you don't Why? need it. <laughs> Do we just need Big DS? Yeah. The Nintendo Big DS. Like, if, if the Switch came with 3D, I'd been like, what? What are you doing? Why are we doing this? Right. Just hold it to your face at the exact right angle. I know, it's like the magic eye of game consoles. <laughs> Like, Let your eyes go out of focus. Wait, wait. Now cross them. Now yeah. slowly uncross them as you move it away from your face. Oh, I see it. <laughs> I lost it. I yeah, either, it. either you see it or you vomit. That's, those are the two options. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, I'm dizzy. Anyway. Well, we do have some big news uh, for us Denverians. If you didn't know, Stu and I are both in Denver, Colorado. And Sometimes I did not realize this. Don't even know that Sometimes fact. we have no idea where we are. <laughs> Uh, DreamHack is coming to Denver this year, so which is kind of a big freaking deal. Um, DreamHack is, of course, this huge PC and console gaming expo type deal. It's I was trying to explain to my wife, like, like play together. A lot of people play games. There's really big esports tournaments that happen. Like each year, there's typically a big a big part of the like the Hearthstone Grand Prix. Grand, Grand Prix, Prix. Or Grand Tournament. Whatever there, whatever the official Thing. Hearthstone yeah. League is. It's not the HGC because that's the heroes. Yeah, it's it's the, the, but it's the HTC, HCT, Hearthstone Championship. I think it's HCT Grand. because I always think they're talking about the TV, and I'm very confused. <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, there's typically a big Hearthstone, like official Hearthstone, Smash Brothers, things like that. And yeah, they're have they recently in the last three or four years they started doing DreamHack in the U.S. in Austin, right? Um, and it's been in Austin this year coming to Denver in October, which is really cool. So, you, I mean, it's it's a pretty cool event because you can get a, a pass for pretty cheap and it's 24 seven access to the event because people are playing all the time. You can also get a LAN seat. And so you actually yeah, get space at a table with um, a LAN connection. And then you, they're, they're doing like, bring your own computer or console, like amateur tournaments and stuff. So it's really cool. Um, it's just really cool that it's happening in Denver because it's, it's just putting us more on the map. And yeah, so there's gonna be some official Hearthstone stuff, a big uh, Super Street Fighter V tournament, some Smash Brothers, and I think Counter Strike is the other big CS:GO. I think is the other big like sounds about right. The whatever that league is called is gonna be happening as well. So that's really cool. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, it'll be fun. Yeah, and we may do some live live oh, yeah. recording or meet upery type stuff there. So yeah, be on the lookout for that. That's uh, October 20th through the 22nd in Denver. So for all of you Denverites or Salt Lake Cityans or Phoenicians or New Mexicans or Texicans, None of the old you Mexicans. can come to Denver. None of the old Mexicans. They won't come here anymore because uh, of the wall. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of it for like newsy type stuff. I've been thinking a lot lately. I'm just going to, I'm just going to uh, steamroll the show. Uh, I know. I've been thinking. Can I slowly back away? <laughs> Stu's, I'm, I'm very Stu's pouring himself a shot. No, I've been watching a lot of speed runs and realizing something happened shortly around my 30th, shortly around, shortly around my 30th birthday. I suddenly gained patience for things that involve skill. I have never been a patient man. Mm. I, have, I have been the classic, I only like to do things that I'm already pretty good at because I don't like not being good at things. And that meant as a kid, I missed out on a lot of really good games. I remember I would like go to my Uncle Matt's house, fire up his NES, play Super Mario Brothers for about five minutes until I got to like World 2 3 and I would keep dying. And then I would just pop the game out and pop a different game in and play like as far as I could without dying and then pop that out and play a different game. I never, like, I'd never learned or been taught like the perseverance to like, no, like, be patient, figure out why you're dying, like, figure out how to like, improve and get past that and like you'll have more fun like actually overcoming these challenges so fast forward 25 years and now i'm 30 and all of a sudden i'm like i would love to like just sit down and practice like world 4 2 of super mario brothers until like i can actually get through it and realizing that's actually a really rewarding part of gaming is the actual skill and the flip side of that is realizing how many games today don't really require a lot of skill out of you. Like they're very linear. They do everything they can to hand things to you on a silver platter. I mean, Nintendo even made like built into Super Mario 3D World, which is like, oh, you died three times in a row. Here, have this suit where you can't die. Like here's easy button built in. And so, I don't know. So I was just thinking about like the role of skills um, with a Z in gaming. Um, 
and I don't know how that's almost like a lost art form of like programming skill, like the require this programming skill requirement into your game. Um, and thinking about really popular games like Hearthstone, where it's like, well, that's not really a skill driven, like there is skill, but it's not like a, oh, you play a hundred games and you, you pick up these mechanical skills or things like that. Um, I don't know. Anyway, I'm kind of all over the place, but I really, I, to me, I broke it down to like the types of skills that are needed to like really enjoy games and get good at them are like mechanical skills, obviously. And that varies from game to game. Like Hearthstone doesn't necessarily have a lot of mechanical skill involved. Like, I hope not. That would yeah, be kind of weird. That would be very weird. Um, but there are like experimentation skills, like being able to actually like objectively like do things, fail at it, and then actually go the next time and figure out, okay, what do I need to do differently? Or even just what's going to happen if I jump here? Um, again, going back to like the speedrunners and how they just like find all these crazy, oh, if you jump into this corner on this particular frame, like you skip the level. It's like that involves a lot of just being willing to experiment and investigate stuff. But then also the, the third one is like the personal skills of like patience and composure and not throwing your, so you're not throwing your controller at the screen and like taking breaks and being able to play in moderation and like actually like the self-control, self-management part that goes into games. And so I don't know. I, I just thought like, there's this whole other science of like designing and implementing a game, which is the skills that the player is going to need. And how do you, how do you teach them what skills are needed? Like how do they learn the skills that they need? And then also how do you, as the game designer, like encourage those and help them develop those skills? Again, something like Super Mario Brothers, well, there's a lot of mechanical skill involved. There is some experimentation involved of like, oh, you can actually jump closer to the piranha plants than you realize because the hitboxes aren't the hitboxes aren't the full size of the sprite. And so you can kind of like, you can kind of clip through them a little bit. Right. Um, and there's also the personal skills of like, if you get tilted, you're going to play worse. And so you have to understand like when it's time to take a break or things like that. So I don't know. It's a little open-ended, I realize, but it's also a holiday weekend and why not? YOLO. YOLO. Yeah. I think what I've noticed is that the medium skill cap games have kind of disappeared from the marketplace. Hmm. So you'll see stuff like, Dark Souls, Bloodborne, even like the indie one, the indie version that's like Hyper Light Drifter. I've said yeah. that game way too many times this episode, but whatever. Um, that are like super hard. You die a ton. It's all about like really building skill caps. And right. Like learning how to play through the game. And learning patterns. And yeah. yeah. And then there's like super easy skill cap games like Angry Birds. Um, no, but even like Super Mario and stuff like that, that are more about the experience of playing the game than like puzzling through it. Like at the end of Super Mario 3D World, I was like, this is awesome. I'm learning a lot. Or sorry, I'm enjoying it a lot. I feel yeah. like I've solved some cool puzzles. I don't feel like I'm a better puzzle solver at the end the same way I might with, you know, something more like Bloodborne where you're like, oh, I actually can just do this thing that I could not have done at the start of the game. I think that's for me what was so interesting about Breath of the Wild, um, not to like put it on this massive pedestal, but it kind of was the first medium skill cap game where I was like, I can play through this and not hate everything, but there are actually a lot of skills I have to develop to play well. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's pretty rare now. Like most games are like either you're totally easy and like someone with pretty good video game skills can breeze through them or you're just the opposite end where it's like this is going to be brutal you're going to play this because it's brutal right and that's what you're here for yeah whereas like breath of the wild was no this is actually pretty enjoyable you're going to go around experience a lot of things but to play the game well you're going to have to develop skills as a player yeah um i hope the success of breath of the wild brings some more of that into gaming yeah I think we're kind of missing it right now. I, I definitely agree with you. Like a lot of games I'll play through and be like, okay, this is cool. I'm doing things. I'm enjoying doing things. I don't know how much I'm learning about doing things in right. this world. Yeah. Um, Not necessarily improving at something. Yeah. And that is interesting about Breath of the Wild because, I mean, when I got through the castle, there's the gatehouse and there's like big old super tough Lionels in there. And my play style usually is more exploratory anyway. I like climbing up all the walls and finding finding the crevices. And like, you can just skip the gatehouse. If if you're the type of player who prefers like scaling walls and sneaking around, you can do that and not have to fight those big lionels, which involve a lot of the combat mechanics and things like that that I'm less good at in Breath of the Wild. 
so it was cool that like my play style and the things that I was good at, like right. finding where to climb and sort of seeing, seeing where I could sneak around was there. I didn't have to, so I didn't necessarily have to spend the time developing like the mechanical combat timing skills as much, but there was a little of that. Or if you're, but if you're the player who likes like the Zelda souls yes. experience, <laughs> you can just go in there and have the long, tough Lionel fight. So yeah, it, it's, that is just, I mean, not to digress too hard, but that is just a really good game. <laughs> it's yeah, kind of absurd how good Breath of the Wild is. Yeah, someone was making the point on another podcast I listened to about, like... You listen to other podcasts? I know, it's, it's insane. Betrayed. I'm just cheat, cheating on you left and right. Um, that, like, what's so cool about Breath of the Wild is that it's like this observe, experiment, learn loop that you just go through the entire mm. game. It's not like see a thing, get told what to do, do the thing, move on to the next thing. It's actually like, figure something out, learn something from it, do it again, like, do it again and slowly build on it. And I think the really hard games like Dark Souls, like Bloodborne, have that. It's just, they're so hard that the learning curve is brutal and you're like hoping to get that from it. Yeah, well, and if you don't have the personal skills needed... Right. If you don't have the patience and the composure and the moderation to like, okay, I'm going to do a few attempts and I'm going to get up and have a drink of water or something, yeah. <laughs> then like you won't ever get through there because that, that loop is so tight of like, okay, you're just going to die instantly. And then the next time you might last a little longer and learn the pattern or whatever a little bit better, but you need those personal skills. Otherwise you'll never enjoy a game like that. Cause I know people also enjoy dark souls. They don't just do it for the prestige. Like they actually yeah, like that, but I watch some people and I'm like, I would not have the patience or the composure. I would be freaking, like my wife would be, she would be listing all of my video game stuff on Craigslist right now if I was playing this because she'd be like, no, we're not doing this anymore. Like this is, this is bad. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, I think, you know, maybe outside of Hearthstone, which can, has other more existential problems like the latter um, and whatnot, Blizzard tends to do a good job. Uh, with games like that where like as you play heroes as you play overwatch you feel like you're gaining skills about understanding and experimenting with the game world right and like even a game like splatoon i would say or like mario kart they have a lot of that where you you just feel like oh i learned this secret power up i I did this other thing and i actually think that's some of the reason why esports are so popular right now is that you feel like you're learning as you go yeah whereas a lot of other rpgs it's just like okay, I'm going to do this thing. It's a beautiful story in this, like, expansive world, but there's no, like, game to it. Right. (laughs) And I'm hoping that, like, maybe with Super Mario Odyssey and stuff, we'll start to see, oh, there are some levels that actually are hard. Like, most of the game will be, like, nice puzzles and you're kind of derp around, but I'm hopeful that part of the game will be like, oh, there actually is a skill curve. There's a learning curve. You're going to grow as you play this. Yeah. Um, that's again, I keep tying back to speed running, but I, it's just, it's more and more interesting to me the more I watch it and the more I think about trying it of it involves that learning and, and there's a cool community. Like a lot of people will like have published things and there's videos and stuff to show you, but you do have to learn, okay, what's the best route if I'm speed running like a platformer? Like, do I, do I want to jump up on that platform and go over or is it faster for me to go under it or If I go up there, is the game going to spawn an enemy up there? Or like you you have to learn and sort of take this observer role for a while um, while you just get like, you're going through it mechanically, but you really have to like switch on this different eye to like, okay, I need to understand like where the enemy is going to come from and how do my actions affect like what's coming up in the game. And to me, that seems like it would actually be really rewarding to play. And like, I actually understand, understand this game. It's not just like, oh, I can't get anywhere and I just keep dying and it's super frustrating actually starting to see there's a reason like you keep dying and the game is actually the game's not just bullshit the game's not just cheating you it like does things in a specific way and it's designed a certain way that you can actually you can understand how it's designed and you can actually get better at it and you know that's actually kind of interesting um that makes me think about it was there's an interview with the rocket league developer and one of the things he credits with the success of the game was actually when rocket league released on playstation it was free that month yeah and so he said one of the things pe- he thought that was helpful was that people got to die together and just, like, suck. Because your first right. games at Rocket League, it's fun just because you're derping around with a car, but you are patently terrible. Right. Like, it is hard to yes. figure out what's going on. And this was actually my play experience, too. 
I was playing with a friend and I was like awful and he was doing all these tricks and I was like, I'm terrible, but this is awesome. Yes. If I can, you, you, all you want to do is just hit the ball. If I can just hit yeah. the ball with my car, I will be completely satisfied. But like how hard it is as a game developer to put a, a community around the game, which is so important. Yeah. Like, and make a skill curve that is not completely flat and not sky, just like a cliff. Right, like make an actual skill curve. It's like a really tough design challenge. Yeah, and I think super often, especially in the case of like mobile games, <laughs> the choice is just okay, whatever. Let's make a flat skill curve. Everyone can play it. They'll get right. money. Let's move on. Yep. And like then you have like again, I'm gonna say Dark Souls, Bloodborne, which do the exact opposite. They're like, we're just gonna build a community. It's gonna be super hardcore gamers. Yeah, They're gonna love it. And I get why they do that, because the middle, the part where it's like this nice slope where you're learning and growing, is really, 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 can I emphasize it enough, really hard right. to actually develop a game that can do that. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of times, understandably, although I wish more developers would take the risk, developers just don't want to take the risk to do that. Totally. Because, right? I mean, if, it's, if, it's, if the game's not accessible enough, you sell fewer copies. But if it's not hard enough, or or if, if there's not a reason to keep playing it, you also sell fewer copies, because the word of mouth is then, well, there's not a lot of replayability, or it's not really engaging or fun. So yeah, it's tricky. And there was like the old school approach, like in the NES era, which was just just make it as hard as possible. Just everything on screen is shooting bullets at you, yeah, and it's there's just... like one pixel's width worth of dodging available, and good luck. And then, so you sort of artificially create that, um, but yeah, games like Dark Souls, which is another really good example of something where, yeah, it's insanely hard, and yet people play it and beat it and enjoy it because it just takes time. I, I think about fighting games. You know, we we had a friend in school together who was big oh, in the yeah. fighting games, and was always encouraging people to check it out because he was just he loved the fact that like yeah, it is hard up front, but you can just learn a few things. You start to learn the combo system of a game or learn how like the meters work. And then pretty soon, like you can actually pull off some of the moves, or you start to recognize the patterns that people are using, and then it becomes this whole fun world of gaming that wasn't available to you just because all you needed to do was put in that little bit of effort to get over that hump. But yeah, how do you entice players to get over that? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the keys is, I think going back to Rocket League, is just finding an interactive mechanic that is fun to do for its own sake. Yeah. Like you could probably sell a game that was Rocket League where you're just like pushing a ball around an arena and that's all you're doing. Yeah. And like people would enjoy it. Like I don't think anyone would consider it a game, but like if someone was just just told you to do that for a while, you would have fun with it, right? Like uh, in Downwell, it's yeah. brutally hard, but like the act of like trying it's to really fun how yeah. you fall is fun. Like even beyond the whole like bigger strategy of the game. Yeah. And I think the way to do it is just to like find the nugget of interaction that's like really cool and then let that be the thing that drives players forward and don't worry about like creating this massive structure that drives them forward. Right. And just like say, okay, this is what's gonna be cool and we're just gonna increment levels of difficulty as they go down in our system. And yeah. Like let them learn as they go. And then this basic this basic interaction is gonna be what keeps them coming back. Yeah. Well, we are about out of time for today. This has been a good topic, though. We should probably re we should revisit this maybe in in two weeks. Um, this idea of sort of how do you how do you put the carrot on that stick for players of like it's worth it to get over this curve. Um, you're going to have more fun, um, especially because a lot of games think they're doing that, and then you get over the curve, and you're like, I'm I'm not having more fun. It wasn't worth. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was not worth the time. <laughs> it was the the stick was a lie. Uh, yeah. Yeah, like the moment in uh, in Zelda when you like try shooting a fire arrow at like the frost wizard or like a frost arrow at the fire wizard, yes. and you see it just poof, and you're like, "That was amazing! Yes, <laughs> it did the thing I thought it would do, <laughs> and I didn't know it would work." Yeah, like moments like those are like so exciting for players because mm. it's not just that you feel like you found an exploit in the game; it feels like, "Oh, I followed the game's logic." Yes. And I did the thing it wanted me to do, and it rewarded me for doing that thing. Yep. So yeah, I think we should definitely revisit it, because it's a, it's a very cool topic. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for listening. Uh, have a happy 4th of July. Um, keep sending us your feedback. 
Uh, email us at mainloopshow at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at the main loop. And please subscribe and leave us ratings in the iTunes store. It helps more people find the show and lets us know if we're doing a good job or not. So we will be back in two weeks, and we'll see y'all. Yep, see ya.